So all uh, yeah, full, you've got a glass full of uh, gin and tonic, um, courtesy of Charles and um, and uh, Fever Tree. And I uh, just want to say a huge welcome to to Charles, who's come back to Imperial um, and uh, to the Enterprise Lab, which is a startup itself within the uh, college. Been around for three or four months now, and. Um, Doing lots of interesting things, and this is just one of the many things we're doing. But uh, and also to welcome you all to one of our first sort of speaker guest speaker events, which um, Charles was very kindly offered to, to sort of basically kick off the series. So oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Giddy piggers. Yeah. So we're going to have a very brief, um, you know, for a few questions that we wanted to. We were curious ourselves from from Enterprise and Imperial. We wanted to ask uh, Charles, and then really leave the majority of the time for you all to ask lots of questions. Um, I've noticed there's a lot of um, students here that we've already seen before and um, we've got your own businesses, so really use this as a great opportunity to uh, be inspired and to hear from the stories of um, our enterprising alumni. So uh, to kick things off, Charles, you're back at Imperial. I know you've been back a few times, but what's it like to uh, walk through the, through the halls? And the the hallowed <laughs> ground. <laughs> um, it's, it, it's nice. Um, well, we live in the area, and so it's never ever been far from uh, from where we are. But uh, no, it's it's nice to be back. And can you tell us a bit about your time here and what you studied and how that helped you become this incredible entrepreneur? Yeah, this is totally irrelevant. <laughs> uh, I uh, I studied mine, mining engineering, and uh, and it had I cannot say it had a great deal of. Uh, Relevance to what I'm doing now, except perhaps it was, you know, the engineering part of it was rigorous. Rigorous thinking is, I think, a part of probably most successful entrepreneurs' journeys. Mm. And you mentioned that after having studied mining, you spent a lot of time in Africa. And yep. my instant thought was maybe you, you had a lot of, you drunk, drunk a lot of gin and tonic, <laughs> and <laughs> mosquitoes, and God knows what else. But, uh, well, mosquitoes and God knows what else. Yes, I did. I mean, I. I came down with malaria and uh, actually um, was cured by the quinine that now we put, the same quinine that we now put into our, into our tonic. Um, it was pure quinine uh, that the Hospital of Tropical Diseases gave us, because at the time, and even now, chloroquine uh, just was, there were a lot of um, uh, resistance to, uh, and, and so I got malaria and it was not pleasant. So it's not just a myth about gin and tonic, it does actually help. You'd have to drink a bathful every night to cure yourself. <laughs> but I advocate that. In general. And um, I guess it'd be interesting to know a bit more about what led you to establish Fever Tree. What, what was the journey beforehand? Yeah, so I mean, I mean, after sort of uh, uh, Imperial, I, I worked for four years. And I, I came back to the UK and then went to um, INSEAD in France and joined Bain. Uh, and after Bain, I really have done nothing but entrepreneurial things. And the first thing of relevance was um, I bought a stake in, in Plymouth Gin, um, which some of you have just been <coughs> drinking. And that's a wonderful old England's oldest working distillery based down in Plymouth. It's, it's well worth a visit if you want to go down there. It's a train ride away, but it's a fantastic old distillery in the Barbican area, which is the only attractive part of Plymouth because uh, the war wasn't kind to Plymouth, but it, it is fascinating. And uh, during that time, we used to take journalists, bartenders down there, and we would show them the competitive set at the time, which was quite limited. It was uh, Beefeater, Tanqueray, Bombay Sapphire, um, and Gordon's, and then Plymouth. And if you put those gins into glass and you smell them, and they were all really difficult, different. The botanicals in each of them were fundamentally different, and they really smelt different, tasted different. But you could only mix them with Schweppes. And as soon as you put the Schweppes into all of them, nobody in the room could taste which gin was which. And that fundamentally undermined the idea of why create a premium gin if everything's going to taste the same when you make a gin and tonic. And so that was the, sort of the initial, uh, the initial uh, thought. And I didn't do anything about it until after I had sold uh, Plymouth um, a couple of years later. We sold it to Absolute Vodka. And, and this uh, guy called Tim Warlow came to me and wanted to launch a gin. And I said, I don't want to launch a gin, but I think I, think I have an idea. And uh, we've never looked back. It's, um, it's been a good journey. And you mentioned that as a, you know, running a gin company, you often had to uh, you're not, not a big drinker, which was quite a surprise for me. But, uh, you know, but then it makes sense because actually you're a tonic company. 
is, is, it the, is it the red flush on my face or the big bulbous <laughs> nose or, what, or what is it exactly that no, you were? No, no, that's not the surprise. I just think, you know, I think uh, we often associate with gin with the tonic and uh, it almost is inseparable. Yeah. It's quite two inseparable categories, but it's just fascinating that you saw this opportunity having come from the, the gin yeah. side and then, and then soon Well, so, because I mean, I literally knew that we, w if there had been a quality tonic water while I was running Plymouth, we would have used it. So much so that we did advocate using Waitrose own label in preference to Schweppes, because at least it was natural. Mm. We didn't particularly like it, but we, on our website at the time when I was running it, said we would use that. And that is a large part of what we've done at Plymouth. So we've literally set out to say, if you were to create um, a, a really quality tonic water, would you use saccharin? Well, no, you, you wouldn't, uh, because it's the oldest, cheapest sweetener out there that kind of cloys the back of your mouth and, and ruins any gin and tonic. And that is what Schweppes offers in the UK to the great British public. It's completely extraordinary that they got away with it, but cost-cutting exercises in the 60s and 70s, not just with them, of course, with all sorts of companies in drinks, in cakes, in foods, all around, they were taking cost out of these things. And in the case of Schweppes, they really didn't have a competition. So, uh, so that was what gave them the opportunity and gave us the opportunity latterly because there's been this fantastic resurgence in the appreciation of drinking quality spirits. And that's marvelous because you had this growth in quality spirits, but no one was providing a quality mixer until we came along. So we had this, actually, it turns out, in hindsight, a really big open goal to, to score. Um, just a two-part question because we were talking to colleagues in Singapore and you know in the States, and they've all heard Fever Tree, um, and but there's, it's now become quite a competitive space. And we've got we've talked about some other some quite niche yep. uh, brands that haven't have got there a little bit later. But yep. what's the current situation now, and what the, what are the kind of challenges you're facing currently, and also what were the challenges that you've experienced to get here? Yeah, oh, I mean, you know, <laughs> there are many. But to answer the competitive issue, we have been, we feel we've been very well competed um, in the sense that we've had everybody from Coca Cola in Spain uh, who have launched two successive uh, products against us in that premium space to Schweppes uh, in Spain, particularly, and their Schweppes Premium, which is owned by Suntory. So these are massive companies uh, with, uh, you know, our total turnover is sort of. You know, it's 10 minutes cash flow to most of these people. And they have really tried to compete with us. And at the other end, we've had lots of small entrepreneurial. Uh, uh, in the UK, you'll have heard of brands like Fentiman's and Bottle Green. Well, they have tried incredibly hard to compete both in the on-trade, on the pubs, clubs, hotels, and also in retail. Uh, and you know, we are still six times the size of our nearest competitor, which is Schweppes Premium in Europe. And compared to the likes of the sort of Fentimans of this world, where we you know are 12 times the size, and you know, and most of the others are just tiny. So, what are we doing? We're, we're, you know, we did. We, it was first mover advantage, which is incredibly important. You know, if you if you have that have an idea and you deliver it well, you've got quite a lot of consumers who will say, "Do you know what? I remember they were the ones who started this," and there's a loyalty to that. So that's been very helpful. And we try and keep things fresh. So, you know, you, you saw at the back there the aromatic tonic. That's a relatively new launch. Um, the Mediterranean tonic water, that was with a septuagenarian French guy who, fantastic guy I met in the Ivory Coast. And I said, Tim and I had had this idea of creating a, a new tonic water, Mediterranean tonic water. And he said, you know, come with me, I'll show you. I'll show you the Mediterranean. It's been fantastic. He took me to these lemon thyme fields in the Drome which is just north of Provence. And I met this family called the Vidal family that have been, you know, four generations have been family. It's really tremendous to be in this world. You're, you're getting quality ingredients that no one else is getting apart from the perfume industry. We're the only ones who are using this, and so maybe some are starting to use it now, but we were the only ones getting this kind of quality uh, in the drinks industry. And it's been a great journey. Interesting, so I'm just curious, I'd just like to um, pinpoint a little bit about maybe your experience of Bain, or is, apart from the first mover, what would you say is the kind of this key ingredient to success in, in the food and beverage space, for instance? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, saw you, I saw some questions you were saying, what are the key things for sort of entrepreneurs? And maybe one, one of the things I think has really helped um, was to slightly have an insider's 
perspective, um, it, inside knowledge, if you like. When I was running Plymouth, that's what gave me the insight. And that was knowing that as a managing director of a gin company, we were desperate to have a decent tonic water. And so that sort of insider knowledge, I think, I, I think that's one of the most important things to try and, try and get in any entrepreneurial venture. You can do a lot of research, and research, of course, is very, very good, but trying to get beyond just desk research and get really involved in an industry to understand what it is that's really needed, I think that was probably one of the most important, uh, important things to start off with. I'm not sure if that really answers your question, but hey, I've had one gin and tonic and you've all had two, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess last question, then we'll open it up. But um, maybe more um, <coughs> general advice, more back to character. What does it take to, to build a business, to scale it up and see it all the way through yeah. the gen? Uh, again, in, an enormous question, uh, obviously. Um, to start off with you, you are you are trying to get people interested in an idea that you think is the biggest idea since sliced bread and trying to persuade people that that's true. And you know, examples when Tim and I were really excited that we were sort of getting good sales at Waitrose and at the pinnacle on-premise accounts in the UK. And God, we'd even got in Ferran Adria interested in Spain. And we were so excited about this. And we did a big interview with a Telegraph journalist, the wine uh, correspondent. And we, we went to the, we told it was going to be published on Saturday, so on Saturday we were <laughs> leafing through nothing. And we rang them on Monday and said, you know, what happened? And he said, oh, well, I gave it to the editor, and the editor thought there was a more interesting story about another Chardonnay. <laughs> <laughs> and it is gutting. Uh, and yet you have to live through this as an entrepreneur and to, until you have got other people to realize just quite how big your idea is and how big... It can be when consumers are starting to really turn on to it, whether they're B2B consumers or whether they're, you know, in our case, they're final, final consumers. And is that first breakthrough when you've got data, data-driven results, you can go and say, look to Tesco, look what we're doing in Waitrose and throw the data down and say, you're not allowed to show me that. Well, I've just shown it. You, know, you, can, you can ignore it if you want, but look. <laughs> um, and I'd say that data-driven stuff, you know, that's what you guys should be so good at. Uh, understanding that this case study of everything, <laughs> of, uh, of the, from the article that the journalist wrote, taking that to Spain, taking it to America, of the data from the, uh, from the retailers, and fundamentally what you're trying to do is actually give someone else some of the value chain. Because it's only you as the entrepreneur who cares about your business for its business sake. You know, I love this business because it's been so much fun. But no one else cares about that apart from me and Tim. What people care about is the fact that we have breathed margin back into the whole system that had been totally deflated all around the world when you had one big company owned by Coca-Cola who would go into the retailer like this negotiating. And all of a sudden, they have a good quality product that the consumer is willing to pay more for because they recognize it's good quality and everybody in the value chain can start to make money. And I don't know what you're doing in entrepreneurial terms, but that's the key to it. I don't care what anybody else says. If we're in a capitalist world, you better see a way for everybody in your value chain. Someone's got to make some money or you're not going to... If you're in a capitalist world, that's the way it is. Right. On that note, here's your opportunity to field some questions to Charles. So um, who wants to go first? We've got one over here. Um, yeah. <coughs> Hi Charles, um, when you were looking for a co-founder, what were you looking for? Uh, how did you find Tim and why did you choose Tim? Uh, he found me. Okay. Uh, I, uh, I'm ashamed to say I was having an outrageously good time for a year having sold Plymouth Gin and uh, <laughs> I, I had had some thoughts about going back into the drinks industry, uh, into the sherry, <laughs> sherry area and I'd been spending a lot of time down in, in Jerez. I thought it was a a real opportunity, but I was actually getting, uh, uh, realizing that it was going to be harder than I thought. And he came to me uh, with this idea for another gin. Uh, but I got on very well with him. So it wasn't me searching for him. It was an opportune uh, uh, moment that he came to me. But I did recognize that the guy had everything that I, I wanted, which was an enormous amount of energy. He's 20 years younger than me. You know, it's, it's been a very, very good relationship. Bright guy. Yeah. 
The U-turn in terms of... Oh, did we make any U-turns? Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> well, the U-turns came before uh, deciding to, to outsource. The U-turns came in terms of when we were... It took a year to get the, the first recipe right um, because we were starting from scratch. We were doing things that a lot of others hadn't done. We were going and trying to find ingredients that other people simply weren't using. And so initially, we, we made some sort of uh, U-turns on, on that. In terms of the outsourcing, that for me was complete... Uh, straightforward idea. Everybody has their skills as an entrepreneur and it's a very important thing to work out early what your skill set is. Uh, my skill set is certainly not in wanting to run a manufacturing plant. There are some extremely good manufacturers out there if you work hard to find them. That's a job but when you found them and in, the, in our case the, the really good ones have been uh, the Showering Brothers who, who used to make Baby Sham of old and they are a fantastic family and they have got an exceptionally high quality facility down in Shepton Mallet and we can bring in all our ingredients to them and they have been incredible partners and they, I'm really, really happy to say they've become shareholders and so they've done well out of Fever Tree and we've done well out of them so it's been a very symbiotic relationship and I, that's been followed by the Green and Blacks, by Newcom Garden Soup, by an awful lot of food and drink entrepreneurs and I would highly recommend it because these guys are experts in their area and as long as you control the quality that goes in and you monitor their processes you can get great product out. Sorry, I'm so sorry. Your business has evolved over the last 11 years. Yep. I mean, the, the, the difficult one uh, is usually, um, it's not a U-turn, it's part of the process. I'm not sure, this is, again, I'm really giving you this. An inflection point. Is it more? Yeah. The, what you're always looking for is, is distribution. You may have a, a great product, and again, I don't, product or service, whatever it is you guys are thinking of, of doing. Once you've got that, the issue is how do you get your consumer to know it, try it, uh, and buy it. And if you don't get distribution, you're up against uh, an almost impossible situation. So in terms of inflection points, the things that we're always looking for is to say, look, is it time for us to do it ourselves in a market and take it away from that distributor who may have been doing a great job? And that is why it has been virtually impossible for any own label to be able to compete effectively with Fever Tree. Because when you have a drink at Christmas time with your friends, or at any time, you don't want to bring out a Sainsbury's <laughs> own label. Even if it says, you know, taste the best, or whatever the hell they do. <laughs> it just isn't the real thing. And that in the drinks industry is extremely valuable to any player who has managed to work that pyramid. And they will always talk about in that food and drink thing, you will start at the top of the pyramid and aim to convince uh, the top bars and restaurants, hotels to take your product and then it will filter down. And to an extent that was true with us. The one caveat to that is this world moves very fast. Uh, an example for us was that we, before we even launched in America, we had three products in the UK tonic, bitter lemon, and a ginger ale. Before we even managed to launch in America, and we were starting from day one to try and find an American importer, a competitor had launched an identical range, fortunately quite disgusting, and with <laughs> wonderful lollipop kind of style, you know, mom and pop kind of ridiculous uh, 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 logo. But it just shows how fast this world is. And the point there I'm making is that a lot of people will agonize over to what whether to let a Tesco in, in our, our space have their brand. Well, I would strongly recommend, and this is a really good reason, and we have had good reasons, but for those guys for whom, for many people, a Tesco is actually 
where a premium shopper in the north of England will go because there is no Waitrose. And that, you know, you really should think twice about saying no to the likes of Tesco. And they have been fantastic for us. They've given us more range, extension, and uh, possibilities than any other retailer. So it's been a very interesting uh, journey. I had a very quick question about the um, slides behind. There were penguins before, but it's not related to this. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's like, Great. It's like technical glitch. Great. Um, but you mentioned there are some photo, photos in here. Is there anything of relevance that you think is um, about the, the, the ingredients or the yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I mean the ingredients. I mean, we the the, the so yeah. If I can perhaps go on to some of, I think there probably yeah. is a uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is Tim, and that he claims is a bloke who was aiming a rocket launcher at him. Now you know you need to corner Tim and say you know it, I wasn't there. Um, <laughs> But this, for example, this, this perhaps is something that's been very useful to us recently. We should say, look, we started off with the premium Indian tonic water. And the whole game there was to use natural ingredients, to use the uh, purest source of natural quinine in the world, which comes from the Congo uh, um, in, in that, uh, and, and wonderful um, orange oil that comes from Tanzania. So these are qualities that no one else was going to, to try and bring a really good quality uh, tonic water to people. So there's quality, but there's also choice. So as we've developed this, and we had people buying into this very, very <laughs> fast, one of the big bets, and one of the most innovative things we did was to say, look, 50% of the UK market is what would have been called slimline. People who, if you ask them, why do you buy slimline? They'd say, because it's got no calories. I just don't want the, I don't want the calories. It was usually uh, women, um, but not always. There was a sort of diabetic thing going on. There were, lots, there, were, there were various reasons. But they would almost all to a woman and occasional man say, we, don't, you know, we know it doesn't taste very good, but we'll take it because of the no calories. Now, flip that on its head and say, fine, everything Feverty does is going to be all natural. But how many people do you think we could attract to buy something where you flip that hierarchy in its head and say, let's make it delicious, all natural, and as low calories as we can. And that has been a phenomenally successful product that we launched eight years ago. And that is, in retail, 50% of our sales, the same volume as that. So that was a really bit of, in, that was, I'm, I'm proud of that one, because that was good, innovative thinking, saying, come on, let's flip this hierarchy and see what we get. It's almost like creating a whole new category within, within it. Yeah. Indeed, yeah. indeed. And, and these others are choices that we continue to give. I mean, this was huge fun meeting this French guy and getting you know, hard work. You know, Tim had to go to the Congo, I had to go to the south of France. I mean, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, we've got one here. Yeah. Um, Charles, you keep mentioning uh, sort of gaining expertise within the sort of field. And uh, sort of prior to buying Plymouth Gym, how did you gain credibility of gaining sort of, you know, because you obviously went into being managed to Yeah. No, it is a really good question, and it's a real catch-22 problem for people, and it really is. Uh, and I contrast that with having done Plymouth, how easy it was to raise money. Because mm -hmm. you go to a, I went to a private equity, and they were all saying, well, look, here's the guy who did Plymouth. He understands drinks. He's worked internationally. You know, it was just so easy. And you're right, and uh, uh, it's a very difficult, very difficult problem. And uh, I think someone had the right attitude to this, is say, you know, if you think you're going to start a business and you need to raise a lot of money to start that business, then you need to rethink your business plan. You need to rethink how can you get it going with very little money and then prove over the first year that you've really got it moving because then you have the credibility. You go and say, look what we've achieved with no money. And to an extent, that's what I had to do with Plymouth. I had a Bain background. It's fine, one of the other investors was a, was a Bainy. But you know, <laughs> on, uh, consultants don't make great entrepreneurs in general because you, you, you analyze things far too much. And by overanalyzing, you miss what is the critical thing, which is look, I think fundamentally I've got something here. This is what I was talking about being the insider, trying to really understand the inside perspective. But once you've made your decision, just go for it. 
and just you'll have roadblocks. Well, fine, jump them, go around them, go under them. I don't care which way you go, but don't let it stop you. If you're sure you've got a great idea. And so it's those combination of things, which is a good question because it's very hard to get going uh, and raise a lot of money for a new venture. It's true. Charles, thanks for this evening. Um, two questions. Well, they're both linked. Um, I'm interested to sort of understand <coughs> how you came up with the brand name. Yep. And how that translates into non Anglophile countries. Because obviously, yeah. this is more well, than it, no, no, no. Yeah. So, uh, we came up with it because there was a book written by Fear Matter Rocco called The Miraculous Fever Tree. Uh, we had been looking for a name that would connote something natural, because that was what we wanted to do with Fever Tree, which was to sort of show that it was so different from you know, the Schrepp's profile, which was the unnatural saccharin filled. Uh, uh, tonic on the market. So we wanted, that was one parameter. But we had had some quite funny ones. Um, uh, Tim was really keen on some names of the hill stations from India. And, uh, and, uh, and I must say, I, I didn't end up paying for this, but we did have some research done. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and one of the ones was, uh, one of the hill stations in India is called Simla. And, uh, and we had this great bloke at the back saying, oh, so it's similar to Schweppes, is it? <laughs> and, and now that is the value of these focus groups. It's not to tell you what to do, it's to tell you what not to do. And actually, uh, Tim and I alighted on the fever tree both at the same time. We both, uh, my father-in-law had, had critiqued Fair Matter's book and he sent me this book and Tim had heard it on Radio 4 or read it at the same time. So we both uh, uh, alighted on the name at the same time. It is a synonym, it, it is the fever tree, is the colloquial name for the Chinchona tree, which is where you can get the purest natural quinine in the world. From yeah. And how does that translate? And how does it translate? Well, I mean, the biggest issue is in China, for example, where you've got to have a, 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 a completely different front label and and you know wh what are you going to choose and these are you have to choose do you choose something that sounds similar phonetically or do you choose something that means something similar or do you do and you know these are I, I still don't know the answer to that one um, well, I think I can't remember what Coca-Cola Coke or was it Pepsi one of them came up with a very I'm not gonna remember these are very these are tricky the rest of it in in the rest of the world we have just gone with it. And in Spain, it's a real laugh because it is a bit like saying to an English person who doesn't speak Spanish, Arbol de la Fiebre. Well, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> it is exactly the same. It's that difficult. And so you get people saying, ah, fever three. And you go, well, I get it. I know why they're saying three. You know, they've come across three more than tree. But it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, they make it into La Fever, and that's fine by me. Uh, and so I think you just have to accept that unless you're going to make a mistake like um, you can do, like the Vauxhall Nova in Spain, I always love that one, you know. You're adding to keep the brand. Yeah, yeah, I think a Nova is a kind of fantastic uh, idea in Spanish um, for a car. But uh, otherwise, we've kept it exactly the same. And we keep the front label the same on everything apart from the regulatory stuff, which says that in some countries you have to put it in fluid ounces, and in some countries it's milliliters, etc. But the back label changes everywhere. And that's a pain, but that's a fact of life. What impact do you think the growth in modern temperance is going to have on the drinks industry? Uh, well, I don't know much about a modern temperance movement. I mean, interesting, the stats actually show. And we, 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 I've been saying for years with Plymouth, and, and you know, we were aiming always at that um, premium drinker. And not, you know, clearly, clearly the, uh, you know, there's a difficult side to alcohol, which I fully acknowledge and, and uh, really understand that. And I respect anybody who says, look, I, I think, you know, when at Plymouth Gin, you were doing the wrong thing by selling alcohol. I, I, I really, everybody's got their own views and I really understand that. Uh, but I had the perspective of reading a lot about the sort of American temperance movement in, 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 in the 30s. And it was a disaster, really, because it just pushed everything underground. And you got worse quality still surfacing and people dying from 
quality, and it, di it, it, it didn't do what it aimed to achieve. And then at our end, we, uh, we've, you know, these, these are premium products that we're producing. You know, Plymouth was a very premium and high-priced product. And so for the people who are trying to get drunk quickly, who are the ones who are probably most at risk from alcohol and its effects, but we think he's not doing, or he or she is not doing, as good a job as we perhaps could do ourselves. These are the kind of big decisions that you are, are really looking for. Um, and I think, yeah, I can't give a better example than that, really. Talk about distribution, talk about your distribution pyramid earlier. Um, yeah. Can you talk us through what you've done and where you've been expanding to sort of like international? Yeah. Whatever. I mean, drinks are uh, unique in the fact that you've got, well, no, not unique, but they've got this wonderful side where you've got both the on trade and the off trade. And that is incredibly useful because a lot of people will find your brand in the on-trade and buy it in the off-trade. And that is a wonderful thing. It didn't feel like we were really playing in that arena. Um, and it feels the same for us now. You know, we, don't, we do promote our products as mixers quite deliberately because that has been an area where we have gained a lot of traction in the supermarkets. But, you know, in the UK, the ginger beer is, is drunk as a soft drink, 90% of it. So, you know, it's a tricky one. I'm not actually aware there is a great temperance movement at the moment. I mean, I do see uh, a lot of people enjoying a gin and tonic, you know. Uh, 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 and, and I'm personally, my personal view is that there's no harm in that. Um, so, I don't know. It's more not from, like, the people being told not to drink. We're just working on a project that's thinking, like, the drinks, drinks industry for the next five to ten years. And the research shows that people are wanting to live a more healthy lifestyle and drink less. So, less, like, yeah. wanting people not to drink, people choosing not to drink. That's what I thought was quite interesting. So, yeah. maybe if your product's a premium product, then you're always going to maintain that market share in a way that things like Smyrna off my use out as people. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think you've answered the. I think you've answered your your question. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about the difference in approach taking a brand with a long history? Yeah. Looking to yeah. revitalize yes. it or expand the yes. new brand. Yes. Yes, I can because I've lived it. Uh, <laughs> And when I took on Plymouth Gin, I was so jealous of Bombay Sapphire <laughs> because, God, I wanted to put it into a gorgeous blue bottle and etch on the botanicals down the side and take out the juniper and put in, oh, God, that would have been lovely. And, uh, 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 and I had this brand that was created in 1793. And, uh, you know, my, my, uh, the guy who I was you know, uh, heavily influenced by then, he was a look, you can't dress the queen in jeans. <laughs> and it was a neat, it, it was a, a neat uh, analogy. There was a limit to what we could do. And our most successful stuff that we did was to respect the fact that it really was a heritage brand and make great play of that. So the fact that it was documented as the, you know, the original naval gin and therefore the gimlet and all these great drinks and to find a book in America saying in my, by an American incidentally, saying in my view Plymouth was the original dry martini gin. You know, this, this was the dynamite and this was where we played. And that bottle that we're now in, I'm so thrilled, was something that actually I'd found on the internet because I got completely obsessed, as any, as any entrepreneur must in their, in their products or service. I just, you know, every waking moment I was overexcited about <laughs> about this brand. So I was on the internet looking for old bottles and buying everything I could and creating a little museum down in Plymouth, which is still there. And I found this beautiful little bottle miniature. And that actually has formed the, uh, the, 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 the template for that. Now, to carry on with your question though, fast forward to Fever Tree. No history. Complete blank sheet of paper. And actually, fantastic because we could literally create that in any way we wanted. We weren't constrained by recipe, we weren't constrained by the package, design, name, anything. And in truth, of the two, I've loved this latest one uh, more. It's been, you know, you being able to create it exactly as you wanted it, and that's been really fun.
be high, high, more highly priced products for them to be ethically, sustainably minded. Is that something that you actually are thinking about to think of communicating to their consumers? So, is the, so, so the question is... I mean, the ethical, there are all sorts of ethical bits to this. So, for example, in our sourcing policies, we have to be very careful um, where we source from. And, you know, the example of, of the quinine from the, from the Congo or the, uh, the fresh green ginger from the Ivory Coast. Um, you know, there are troubled regimes in various areas. And we have, as you can imagine, um, through two sets of private equity sales, the, <laughs> the process the due diligence that you have to go through to make sure that the next buyer of the equity is making sure they're not going to get completely sideswiped by something. Um, so we've been through that and as a public company we take it incredibly seriously uh, and we do have all of our suppliers have to sign all of these standards to say that there's no child labor, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, the ethical side on the, on the, on the sort of temperance thing, I, I, we're not at the forefront of this. You, you know, it's Diageo and Pano Ricard who are producing, we are not producing alcohol. So on that, on that side, you know, that is not, we're not at the forefront of that. Uh, one of the ones that we've come across at the moment is the sugar debate, which is a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a good debate. Um, and we feel we've been slightly tang tangentially affected because really this is about childhood obesity. This is about families that haven't got a lot of money letting their children have four or five sodas a day when they clearly shouldn't be. This is not about someone spending, you know, 70 pence on a quality mixer to go with their premium gin or, or whatever. But tangentially, we've been caught up in that. And, you know, actually, again, we've been very, uh, you know, proud to be able to say, before this ever became an issue, we created this naturally light area which was all about trying to give people that sort of what we perceive to be an ethically sensible choice for them, lower sugar, uh, but a really good tasting all natural product. And I'm, you know, I, I would still be very firm in my mind, I'd much prefer a natural product to something that's got aspartame or saccharin or, or, or one of these artificial uh, sweeteners in. Um, so Charles, um, I'm, I'm just wondering, um, you, you've got such a good business model with such fantastic products. So what makes you think of letting the company go public? Well, uh, like it's about the that wasn't that wasn't the decision. You know, the decision to go public was uh, it was more about um, do you know you'd have to wind it right back to when we started. Uh, to, to everything's related in this in this sort of business world, and uh, if I had my time again, I would have funded the first bit entirely myself. I absolutely could have done, but I decided to have um, an, another person, effectively a sort of private equity, come in with half of the business. And uh, Tim and I were running it, doing absolutely everything. But when we were looking to raise more money. Um, the only way out of the sort of bind that we kind of created here was to bring in uh, um, professional private equity because the value of the company was always already becoming clear. So we were already into the millions in valuation before we took in the next tranche of money. And at that stage, I genuinely didn't want to put my hand in my own you know, Plymouth gin pocket to go and uh, do that. And then you had private equity in. Now, private equity was great for the first five years, but then they had the right to be able to try and sell their shares after five years, and they duly did. And that process was unbelievably painful. To, by this stage, we were looking at values of 50 million quid. So why was it painful? Because the due diligence process, the um, you know, we were forced into a process whereby we were allowed to choose who was going to run the process and we were therefore allowed to use KPMG. But KPMG's job was to get as many people, was to get the highest price for the exiting shareholders. And therefore, they did their job. They had 24 companies and other private equity firms come and kick our tires. 
Now, the time that that took meant that Tim and I, for an entire year, never got to America, our second biggest market, because we simply couldn't afford to leave the process alone. And that's unbelievably painful. And we have quite an amusing graph which shows our growth rate, which was just basically sort of going nice and exponential until suddenly, 2012, when we were put into this process. And we went flat virtually for a year. And the day after we had sold to the new private equity, we, we've carried on like that. And that's what happens. So you've got to understand the sort of the downsides of private equity. There's some real upside of private equity. There's some real downside. And I never, going back to your question, I never wanted to be in that situation again that we would uh, have our, uh, necessarily have our, our eyes taken off the ball that badly. And private equity will sadly, and they'll admit it themselves, always sell their best assets first. So if you've got a lousy business in a private equity portfolio, brilliant, you're going to be left alone. They'll <laughs> kick you, they'll punch you occasionally, but you're on your own, mate. You're going to die quietly in a corner. If you're a good business in a private equity firm, they're going to put you for sale the second their contract says they can put you for sale. And six months before that, they're going to say, we're going to put you for sale for six months' time, so you better get your ducks in line. So you may have two and a half years running your business before they're going to take their, your eye off the ball again. Now, contrast that with the public markets, where it's rather like chucking ingredients into a mangle, turn the handle, and out pops a price. And you either say, yep, I'll take that price, or you say, nah, we won't, we'll stay private. And actually, the public markets so far for us have been very good. So th that was our reasoning, long-winded, but there you go, you asked for it. Uh, what role did the product None. And don't believe a word when they say, we are going to add more value than you can believe. Just laugh quietly, not in their faces, uh, and, and try and go back to them with a straight face and say, great, look forward to it. It's nonsense. I mean, you know, if you're a good professional management team and you know your business, I mean, very exciting um, because we've just um, uh, been looking at this and what we've achieved with gin and tonic. We're now in 64 countries that we know of, but actually it's probably m many more. I mean, amazingly, we've got to sort of, in Waitrose, 47% market share of the tonic. I mean, it's un we, we would not have thought we could achieve that. In, 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 in this area, but various things have, have gone well and that's amazing. And what's exciting now is that we have whole territories where we're just starting to see the seeds of growth that we've had now for a lot of time in the UK and Spain and, and Belgium, and we've got places you'd never imagine uh, would even be interested in gin and tonic, like Northern Italy, like Germany, like, like Holland. You know, they used to do Geneva, but it was never gin. You know, they taught us how to make and now we're selling it back to them, and that's really exciting markets, so, you know, uh, really growing fast. And then we've got other markets all around the world that are doing just the same. In America, you know, we really feel we've, we're, it's growing very fast. It's big, it's our second biggest market, but masses of upside. And then we've just been pointing out to, you know, very excited because gin represents, premium gin re represents 6% of the premium spirits market. Dark spirits represent 60% of the premium spirits market. And so we have, and we are in the process of, creating a whole new range of mixers to go with these dark spirits. From rums, where obviously cola, coke, is the really big one. But the problem with coke is twofold. One is it's got um, phosphoric acid in it, which is a very harsh acid. It's the one that dissolves your teeth. Um, and actually it kills any good rum. So the spirits companies don't want to work with coke. And Coke don't want to work with the spirits companies because they are ethically focused on children, etc. So they don't want to do that. Enter Fever Tree with a much better product. And we're hoping that we, in the mixer, in the mixer area, uh, will have a lot of room on that. Ginger ales, uh, some soda waters with some twists. So for the connoisseur, the, not the guy who's sipping his single malt, but for the guy in the next layer down who's interested in premium blends, an enormous opportunity. So uh, we, we, you know, 
Timing is always difficult to predict, but I think there's really an enormous opportunity. Just to end maybe with a couple of questions, more on a personal note. So a lot of entrepreneurs don't necessarily see the journey through. There's a lot of things that often, um, you know, maybe they can't scale up with the company because of their network or their, their stomach. I don't know what it might be, but yeah. um, uh, how have you, um, have you, do you factor in at all any transition planning or is this, uh, do, you, do you have any plan in terms of your own personal journey with the company? So, I mean, the, 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 the greatest, uh, you know, um, the greatest thing here is, is, you know, I think having good people in your business and, and, and you hear everybody say it from Branson to everybody else and they're right. And actually as a successful entrepreneur, you spend a lot of time uh, recruiting. It is a part of, that you may not want to have to do, but it is an absolutely necessary part of the business. And, and um, I was CEO for 10 years, and at the time of Float, I handed over to Tim. And, you know, amazing. He is changed gear again. You know, it's extraordinary what a competent person can do when, uh, when they're really given the full uh, thing to step up to. So, you know, I've virtually made that uh, change already in pers personally, and I've got this outstanding colleague who I started this thing with and we get on, you know, we, we've been working together 13 years now. So I'm very lucky with that. And uh, so that is the, the key thing. But people are, are absolutely the key to these, these successful businesses growing. And uh, what's, what's next for you? Are you going to disrupt uh, that Coke or...? Uh... No, I mean, I'm still very, very involved in, in this business for the strategy. But it's, <laughs> it's uh, you know, the... the, the um, now that Tim is CEO and now that we have a, a, a director of, uh, of you know, international, I used to do all the South American stuff, um, well, he does a much better job than me now, so I don't need to do that. So, I mean, I don't quite know uh, um, uh, yeah, how, how it will go, but the, the, the business is in a very strong position and I'm absolutely committed to you know, remaining working with Tim uh, on the strategy, where we're going in terms of you know, products, packaging, countries, uh, the, the marketing strategy. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot going on also in, in, in finding other, other locations to produce. So there's an enormous amount still to be, to be done, and I'm thoroughly engaged with that. So now I'm staying where I am. Sounds like a good place to be in. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, if there's no more questions, we'll be uh, just a uh, round of hands to say thank you to well, Thank you. Thank you. I hope it, hope it was useful. Thank you to Marcus from Development for making this, uh, to, to, for bridging this relationship. We really appreciate it. Uh, to the Enterprise Lab team, and very specifically, uh, Lauren Dennis, uh, just at the back there, who's our awesome uh, student in residence here at the lab, who has actually been very much the driving force behind this event. So thank you, everyone, and thank you, Lauren, in particular. Thank you.